This is the figure text model because it is exactly solvable or integrable. And so you can, uh, you can work out exact results. Exact results are important because they are kind of uh, uh, building blocks. I mean, the kind of basement on which you can elaborate to obtain further results. And uh, the, the exact result, you can trust it because it is exact. You, you are, don't have to mind about how good is approximation. It is exact. So what is a six vertex model? The six vertex model is a model of uh, arrows defined on a lattice. We can consider any tetravalent graph, but we consider as usual the square lattice. And we put arrows on the edge of the lattice in this way, for instance. Of course, I will not draw everything. So in principle, what uh, the partition function is given in terms of the vertex, local vertex configuration. So in principle, each arrow, each arrow have to be directed along the edge. So it has two possible direction. And so for each vertex, in principle, we have two to the fourth possible confi vertex configurations. In the six, that is 16. In the six vertex model, we impose an additional rule. We impose that the number of arrows arriving, entering a given vertex is two, and thus is equal to the number of outgoing arrows. So the six vertex configuration, which are allowed, are, for instance, this one and uh, the one in, in which you reverse all arrows. Sorry, Filippo, we don't see the arrows very well. Maybe you can just uh, draw a ah, little bit. small, uh, you mean? Uh, yes. It's not uh, clear. Is this improving? Uh, yes, a bit better. Mm -hmm. OK. Yep. Thank you. So this is just a piece. You have to do this for all, the, all uh, for the whole lattice, and it can be longer by hand. But uh, uh, so the six vertex configuration, which satisfies this ice rule, that is uh, the fact that you have always two ingoing and two outcoming arrow for each vertex, uh, restricts the 16 vertex to just six different vertex. Here I have defined uh, two vertex. Here the arrow goes uh, south and west. All arrows go south and west. Here they all go north and east. I have just reversed the arrows. So these are kind of, uh, they are related by inversion of arrows. Then we have another one, which is, for instance, this one. Where again, I reverse arrows. So here we have uh, two to the left and two down. Here we have two to the right and two up. Uh, on the same line. And finally, we have this. I hope it's really readable. Yes, yes, that's, uh, I know. that's good. So these are the six vertex of the six vertex model. And uh, the model is defined by assigning some Boltzmann weight to these local configurations. And you make the product, and you have the Boltzmann weight of a configuration on your portion of, of the lattice. You consider, for instance, some uh, rectangular domain on your square the lattice. You make the product, you sum over all possible configurations satisfying the ice rule, and this is a partition function. Uh, what to say about this? Uh, as you have seen, to to draw arrows is really lengthy, so I will always put a heavy line each time the arrow is down or left. Okay, so actually the vertex are just these ones. These are the first two, then you have a So you have six different arrows, and uh, you can assign weights 
Boltzmann weight, in principle, six different Boltzmann weights, but uh, we can restrict to a simpler situation where we have symmetry and the reversal of errors. So we impose, we choose to give the same Boltzmann weight to vertices which differ only in a, uh, the only difference is a global reversal of all errors. The six vertex weight are usually called the ABC. And uh, for instance, if you choose on your lattice some uh, some boundary condition, let us say we choose periodic boundary condition. So on the top and on the bottom, we must have the same configuration. And on the left, we must have the same configuration as well, for instance. Then we have just to, to build paths, which can, you can imagine, they are not oriented, but you can imagine that they follow the arrow, so they go down or left. So for instance, a possible configuration here is this one. Here you could go, for instance, here. And then you have this one. But it is clear, it is clear that, for instance, here, instead of having gone this way, you could have gone also this way. And this would have given you a different configuration, OK? So configuration in this. Picture are just paths on a lattice. The paths are, uh, I mean, you can rephrase this model as a model of non intersecting paths, uh, but uh, actually, this is not true here because you see that here the paths intersect or, or at least they touch, they osculate each other. And uh, if you choose a very particular weight, to the all vertex, then you can reduce the problem to a problem of non intersecting paths, so a free fermionic problem. But in general, you have these paths which can interact because they have weights, okay, when according to the relative position. What to say about this more? Yes, an important thing is that you have a conservation of line. Here, if you have two lines, two vertical lines in this first row, you see that you have again two vertical lines in the second row and again two vertical lines in the third row, etc. So you have a conservation of line, which is a, a actually a kind of charge conservation. It's U1 due to some U1 symmetry, which is exactly the U1 symmetry which was mentioned yesterday in the exacted chain of uh, the lecture by Professor Posguy. The model was introduced, well, a simplified version of the model was introduced very a, long, a lot of time ago by Pauling to calculate the entropy of ice. You can see the story on Wikipedia. It is a nice story if you go to the six vertex model entries of Wikipedia. Uh, the exact solution of the model was given by Lieb and Sutherland in two independent paper. If you go on physical review later, you see that the end of the paper of Sutherland and the beginning of the paper of Lieb are on the same page, but it was completely independent work. Um, they were submitted at a few days of distance, actually. Okay, so the model was solved in the sense that uh, uh, the free energy was evaluated, and actually it was solved by Bete Ansat, a kind of a coordinate beta answer because it appears that there is some underlying algebraic structures. You can compute the transfer matrix, for instance. And if you compute the transfer matrix, you see that the eigenvectors of the transfer matrix of the sig vertex model are exactly the same as the eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian of the XXZ chain. So there is a strong relation, which I will be uh, explain further later on. That it is a strong relation between the six vertex model and the x exit chain. So let us, this picture I will keep for some time. I mean, it will be our reference picture for the weights. So let us, when you know the free energy, you can evaluate the phase diagram of the model. 
So we have ABC and we report, of course, you can always rescale the three weights and uh, to scale away one of the three because it's uh, like choosing the zero of the energy of local configurations. So the phase diagram actually depends on A over C and B over C. And it is made in this way. You have uh, essentially one, two, three, four regions, but uh, these two are just essentially the same. So this is called a ferroelectric region. This is a model of arrows which you should think about as a, a um, polarization arrow. So for instance, uh, breaking the symmetry between the two vertex with weight A by assigning two different weights, A1 and A2, means just introducing some external electric field. And here we are just chosen to put no electric field, and so we have a kind of symmetric situation. So this is why it's called ferroelectric instead of ferromagnetic. So these two regions are ferroelectric. Ferroelectric means, among others, that the correlation function decay exponentially, to, and uh, the one-point function is as a, the polarization has a non-zero expectation value. Here you have an anti-ferroelectric region. Uh, again, uh, you have exponential decay of, um, of correlation functions. Uh, what you have to compute, well, what you see actually is that um, polarization has zero expectation value, but if you compute some staggered polarization, that is assigning a different weight every two vertex, you see that this quantity will be non-zero. And this is called a disordered or critical or critical region. It is disordered, so you have uh, polarization is zero, and it is critical in the sense that correlation function decay algebraically. So it's not a critical point, you see, you have a whole critical region, okay? And, um, what are these lines? So there is an invariant, uh, there is an important parameter in this quantity, which is, is not an invariant, sorry, which is the following. You can compute from the two, from these three weights, this parameter delta, which not by chance is called as the delta of the x z chain. It has this expression and the phase of the model are parameterized only by delta, in fact. So you have three parameters, but you can rescale one. So in fact, you have two. One of these parameters is delta, and the other one is the ratio between B and A, okay? So this parameter is not really important. It's uh, in a domino language, this would be just to give an additional bias to vertical domino with respect to horizontal one. It's not really important. This is really what tunes your interaction between dominoes. I will come back to that later. And it is, the relevant parameter of the model. So this line, for instance, is a delta equal one line, and it separates ferroelectric and critical lines. The same for these lines. And this is instead the delta equal minus one line. So in, the, in terms of delta, the critical region is given by You have three regions for delta, and these three regions correspond to the three regimes. When uh, you move in this diagram, actually delta increases in this direction. So here delta is minus infinity, here delta is minus one, and here delta increase to, till one. Then to go to larger delta, you have to go in this way. But um, Instead, if you move, you vary the parameter t, you are moving in this direction. You are, you are just uh, giving more weight to a or to b, okay? So for instance, we can choose delta equals zero. 
If you choose delta equals zero and you vary t, you will move on this line. This is called the free fermion line, and this is called the free fermion point. And this free fermion point is correspond to the domino tiling. In a way, I will explain further. Then there is another important point, which is here. When A equal B equal C equal, for instance, one, and delta, you, you plug inside, and delta is just one half. This is called a combinatorial point, and uh, it is a particular in the sense that even if it is an interacting point, uh, you can compute a lot of things. There are some simplification, usually solution of uh, the free energy and everything are given in terms of very complicated transcendental functions. And uh, at that particular point, everything tends to become algebraic. I mean, many things become algebraic. Uh, there is an equivalent of, of this combinatorial point, for instance, in other model, which is for instance, in the eight vertex model, that is a combinatorial line. This was mentioned yesterday by one of the students. And uh, well, this point uh, was very important for mathematician, which studied without knowing anything about the six vertex model in the 80s and 90s. And uh, actually, with the six vertex model, you can solve all these combinatorial problem in a very, in a much simpler way. Then there is another combinatorial point, which is somehow dual, which is here. Delta equal minus one half. So this is, I think, enough for the phase of the model. Ah, yes. So this line separates two phases. So here there is a phase transition, and it is a first order. And the same here. This is a first order phase transition. Instead, this line. The delta equal minus one line is uh, the phase transition is of course the tallest type in the sense that if you compute, for instance, some the derivative of the free energy across this line, you will see that it will be continuous together with all its derivatives. It's uh, a kind of it's costless tallest costless tallest transition, which is, uh, for instance, maybe we have already seen in the X Y model. Okay, this is enough for now. Uh, maybe we should pause a little bit for questions. Yes, that very good. A lot of information. Yes, so, are there questions? Well, let me start with one. So, a very na uh, naive one. So, how can it be first order? Uh, I mean, usually when we think about first order transitions between two gapped phases, two, yeah, two, two phases that are not critical, right? Like, uh, I don't know, water uh, between, uh, you know, solid and, and yeah. liquid. Well, uh, uh, so how can it be first order between a gapped phase and a, and a critical phase? Um, well, I don't remember. I don't remember the mechanism, actually. Uh, I should think about that. Uh, uh, OK, anyway. Uh, well, if you I will think about that. Uh, you're right. Uh, I just remember it's, it's for further, but uh, okay. Well, well that okay, was supposed to be. It was supposed to be a, an easy question. So, uh, okay, let's forget it. Uh, are there any other questions? See, si, see. Si. Yes. Yes, it's not, uh, yes, you're right. Uh, okay, no other question. Sorry, Fil Filippo, I have a question. Ah, there is a question. Uh, so does this phase diagram holds for all the possible boundary conditions or just in the periodic case? Sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, uh, because uh, of yeah, this is a very important question, yes. So is this, uh, what are the boundary conditions you are- Okay, uh, you are uh, completely yeah. right, yes. Yeah. This is a phase diagram derived for periodic boundary conditions. Uh, yes, uh, true beta ansatz, uh, for instance, uh, you solve the model according to Lieb and Sutherland, uh, the solution is given also in Baxter's book, and then this is a phase diagram you obtain. For different uh, boundary condition, you, well, even if you are able to compute the free energy, things are a little bit different. Uh, but uh, the phase diagram has not been computed analytically, 
what you know, well, I will come back to this, but uh, what I have said yesterday essentially is that according to the point in space where you are, you will have a local free energy, which looks like this one when you are in the disordered region and look like this one when you are in the ordered region. But uh, uh, if you compute, I mean, this was computed with periodic boundary conditions, so it is uh, it assumed translational invariance. Okay, so I would like to comment a bit about the relation with the six vertex model, with um, the X and Z chain. So there is one obvious relation. It is just that uh, you, you all know that there is this standard correspondence between uh, classical two-dimensional system and quantum one plus one dimensional system. And so you can think that the, the six vertex model is a kind of quantum spin chain, Eisenberg quantum spin chain, X, X, Z, Eisenberg quantum spin chain, with evolution in discrete Euclidean time, imaginary, in, in discrete imaginary time. Okay. And indeed, as I have already said, the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian of X, X, Z, uh, sorry, eigenvectors of the uh, Hamiltonian of X, X, Z are the same as the eigenvector of the transfer matrix of the model above. Again, I am assuming boundary, periodic boundary condition. And um, how can you relate in a more quantitative way the two models? There is a procedure which is called Hamiltonian limit. That is, you can go from the six vertex model in a particular limit to the XZ chain. Of course, not vice versa. It is a limit. It is a limit from a lattice to a continuum in the time, in the discrete time direction. And so you can only go in one direction. And I will. <coughs> so, for instance, if you put A equal one plus alpha epsilon, B equal beta epsilon and C equal one plus gamma epsilon. Then what you see, you can build, okay. And then you send epsilon to zero. You can build the transfer matrix, expand the transfer matrix in epsilon. And what you obtain is that is a identity, T transfer matrix is, a, is an operator in a space, if you consider a, a row, a, tra a row transfer matrix of this kind, for instance, which is of length L. Of course, the transfer matrix is an operator which act in a two to the L space. And uh, if you think it as a matrix, it's a matrix two L times two L. So this is identity in this two L by two L space. And then you have, uh, you expand this T, sorry, I will write it here. It appears that T is identity plus beta epsilon Sorry, I should be, uh, I should define you the transfer matrix first. So let us do it. I will. Let us consider a, a, a very simple transfer matrix. We denote it by, we suppose that our lattice is just by one vertex in one direction, and then we build the transfer matrix. So we have to associate a matrix which uh, um, tell us the rule of the vertex, vertices. So, so for instance, you consider the vertex which are on the top of the blackboard on the right, ABC, a, and you see them in this direction, let us say we see them in this direction. Then it is easy to verify that this matrix, I will tell you the code. So you, you should think that you could associate to each 
to each line, to each, uh, you have this vertex. And here you associate an Hilbert plate, which is two dimensional and uh, which can take value one or zero according to the fact that you have a weight and a heavy line or nothing. And the same here, you can put a weight one or zero. Or if you, if you prefer a weight plus minus. And so you can build your Hilbert space Hilbert space in this uh, C2 as this is C2 space, and you can think of operating on this Hilbert space with two by two matrices, and you can choose the base of the basis of Pauli matrices. So, for instance, consider the first vertex there on the left. So it is uh, the vertex, the first vertex of type A. This is a vertex where here you have a line, here you have a line, here you have a line, and here you have a line. If you look it at in this direction, you can see that the transfer matrix, so you have to build the, the you associate to this line, for instance, you associate a one two-dimensional space to this other line one, another a second two-dimensional space, you have to make the tensor product. So you will have to write in terms of sigma Pauli, Uh, of a polymeric sigma, something which gives you a positive entry each time you have a, in entering two plus and going out to two plus again. So this can be done by doing by doing in this way. Let us say that this is space I and this is space I plus one, okay? And uh, so if you build, for instance, uh, this quantity, this quantity uh, is a four by four matrix, you should think this as, as a tensor product. So this is the entry plus plus, then you have four entry which are The same here. Okay. So what you, you want to build this air matrix? You have to put um, the weight ABC in such a way that you reproduce the vertex in this sense. For instance, for the, the vertex which has all full lines, we want to to carry on the situation with two entering particle and two outgoing particle. So we have entering two, pl two plus and going out two plus. So here we should put some, the weight of the vertex of this vertex, which is A. The second vertex, you have nothing. So you are sending no particle, no lines or a down spin in the space I and in the space I plus one in the same situation. So you have to put an A where on the entries which associates the space minus minus, no line on both, on both edges. And here again, no line on the outgoing edges either. And so you put A this way. If you play this game with all the entries, you see that, by the way, you have a four by four that is 16 entries. And the entries are in this way. Maybe the explanation was not totally clear, I realize. I will, uh, I have mixed two things, so the order is the following. So you first build your, it has been according to the situation, but uh, you, your transfer matrix for one side. And uh, you just build it, uh, in, you know, in a kind of automatic way, just by thinking this as a kind of scattering diagram where you have entering particle and an outgoing particle. Particle have two, two states, uh, plus and minus. And so you can associate to this scattering matrix uh, various values to the different configuration and the values which correspond to this source of the weight 
are given by this matrix. Then it appears that this matrix, so now the, the Pauli matrix enters the game. It is just a question of a small computation to verify that this matrix can be written as A That is in one half here. Okay. So the transfer matrix from one side is just uh, as this form by direct inspection. Then you can express this in terms of Pauli matrix and this is expression. Now you, you replace n, b, and c with this parameterization and you send epsilon to zero. You make the limit for epsilon to zero of this quantity and the result is as follow. plus so here now you can uh, you can uh, focus on this quantity sorry Filippo is this is that T or R this matrix well it's R yes uh, I have called it R it's R you could consider the T, the transfer matrix, you just make a product of this R, and then if you make this calculation, you will have here in the expansion, product of one plus something will give you one plus sum of something of order epsilon. And uh, so some sum of i of this, and this will reproduce the Hamiltonian of the XXZ XXZ chain. If you instead focus on just one site, a one vertex uh, transfer matrix, this is R operator, then you have just to, you will obtain, of course, the Hamiltonian, the Heisenberg Hamiltonian XXZ for one site, for two sites, for a pair of sites, you see. So, the moreover, you have the identification delta equal alpha minus gamma over beta in this limit. Uh, sorry, Jerome, yes, please. No, I think someone was asking something, but I think it's Andrea. Uh, ah, Andrea, Andrea are you, uh, Capelli? Yes. Are you asking something, Andrea? No. Ah, no, okay. Ah, okay. So just a minute, then. Okay, no sorry. Okay. Well, so maybe, so, sorry, so uh, this was also quite a lot of information. So uh, maybe, are there questions or... I think may, perhaps it was not entirely clear what the re relation between uh, this uh, four by four R matrix and the transfer matrix uh, is. Um, yes. So yes, I don't. Yes. I mean, I know. I know what it is, but uh, maybe. No, no. Yes, I should maybe. Not well, uh, so. I, I not really wanted into this detail, but actually, just one minute, so, so we can say this. Uh, so if if so, there are some uh, questions uh, about that, let us do it here. So, well, I assume everybody knows what is a transfer matrix. You can have something 
it's something like this, where, where uh, here you have some entry, which is again uh, plus minus, I will call it uh, alpha. Here some in index plus minus alpha, some index plus minus beta. And here you have a lot of other index, which I, we could call alpha one, alpha two, alpha L. If L is the length of a row of the six vertex model, and here you will have beta one, beta L. And so, this is a transfer metric, and the transfer metric can be built as a product, as a product of uh, R. So you do R12, but uh, it is a particular product. You have to make a tensor product. You... So this will be, well, it's usually called a monodromy matrix. If you are interested in uh, periodic boundary condition, uh, you have in, de, to identify alpha and beta and to sum over the two, po two possible values of alpha or beta, which are plus and minus. So you have only to take the trace over alpha beta. It is a two-dimensional trace of this operator. But uh, first, uh, in the other direction, you apply the transfer matrix many times. And then again, if you have uh, uh, periodic boundary condition, you, well, I have uh, cancelled this. So here, for instance, you consider this as the first row and uh, as a transfer matrix. And so, you are, sorry, you, you start from some configuration. You apply this transfer metric here, you obtain another configuration. You have to sum over all, all this intermediate configuration, and then you apply again another transfer metric, et cetera, until you arrive at the end. Then you impose boundary conditions, so you have to trace over all these indices, which are identified when you have added. The, and for the periodic boundary condition in the other direction, on the two vertical sides, you have instead to identify these ones. Okay, so maybe it was not so illuminating. Uh, I mean, you have to do the computation on your own, otherwise you will not realize. But I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, what I wanted to say is that in terms of the phase diagram, the x edge chain can be thought as this part of the diagram. You should imagine when you do this limit, you are essentially going to this point and you are with the lens, you are magnifying this point and um, here, when you move, as I told you before, where, uh, all these constant delta lines are the lines which, which are more or less in this direction and they all meet in this point. And so you can, uh, uh, if you here, you, you make this expansion at around this point, which is exactly what we have done here. Uh, you recover the exit chain, which are X exit chain, which are as three regime on the line. This is a line of delta, which is now a line because we have really compressed it to this point, to the enabling of this point. And you have delta, which can be below minus one, larger than one on its intermediate region. And again, you have anti-ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic and critical or disordered regime for the quantum spin chain. Okay, this is the relation between the two models. Why I say this? Because if you have information about the six vertex model, you can do this limit and you can obtain some information for the x exit chain. The problem is that usually it's more difficult to compute something on the six vertex model. So it has not been done so often, but it has been done, for instance, by Jean Marie Stéphane and also by Jerome Dubai, by Jacopo Vitti. And uh, actually, this connection which is, uh, has been known for a long time, but in the context of dimer has been put on solid ground by these people. So I think it is a good uh, time to stop here. If there are questions, it's a, if there are questions, uh, well, also why we can make a break. Possibly. Filippo, sorry, I have a question on the phase diagram. Maybe it's related to the question of Jerome. Yes. So, so is there a three critical point in this phase diagram? No, no, no. Where this line meets together, no? Because if you have a first order phase transition and then certain point this first order will end some, some, somehow, they should end in some three critical point.
Yes, but uh, you know, uh, this, where do these ends? Yeah, maybe this point uh, dealt uh, where this here, is the line. Here you have really, you have yes. a kind of mess. Uh, or, or if you don't, do not expand, you don't know what is this point, okay? Because you're concentrating in this point uh, uh, the three phases. I mean, uh, yes. uh, antiferro. Yeah. And here, uh, this uh, join at infinity. No, no, I mean the point, uh, this point here. Point. Sorry? Yeah, the point that you were uh, indicating. B, B over C equal one. Yes. And uh, A over C equal zero, for instance. So, uh, yes. What about this point, you mean? It's not a tricritical point. No, it's not a tricritical point. It's a mess. It depends. Uh, you know, um, ah, maybe you can view it as a tricritical point. Yes, there are three phases. Yes, you well, uh, you have really to magnify a lot so to see this. Uh, you know, it, yes, maybe it's a trivial point. I, I have never read everywhere that this could be a trivial point, but in fact, it's, it's quite possible. If I can say something in answer to Jerome's statement, it's not impossible from the point of view of Landau Ginsburg because. Critical, critical point is just a five four term is zero. But then you can have a I order term that make a bump and then you go to a, you have a first order transition. So it requires some fine tuning, but it's not impossible to connect a critical point with a critical region with a first order transition. Okay. With a, with a first order transition. But, okay, uh, yes. it's, it's a bit unusual. Fine tuning, so it's not natural, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question in in the chat. Um, so, Errol, so so let me read the question. So, do the XXZ Hamiltonian and transfer matrix of the six vertex model have a common eigenbasis? Uh, so, yes. let me stop here, and then I read the rest yes, of the question. Uh, they have the same eigenvalues, actually. Yes. Actually, the, the relation, uh, it is, this expansion comes from the fact that T, the transfer matrix of the six vertex model is related to some uh, no, where this delta T is a discrete time step. Yeah, that is a kind of, uh, well, you should uh, see it in the other way. Uh, probably it's more correct to say that uh, AJ, AZZ is connected to the first derivative of the transfer matrix with respect to some spectral parameter. But uh, then it becomes very technical immediately. So, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, for sure, the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix of the sig vertex model, sorry, eigenvectors are the same, coincide with eigenvectors with periodic boundary condition, coincide with eigenvectors of the XZ uh, Hamiltonian. Yes, so, so one could say that the, it's the same Hamiltonian and, and the transfer matrix of the six vertex model uh, commute. It, yes. yes, yes. Okay, and, uh, so, and now read, let me read the, the, the rest of the question because that was only the uh, first part. So the full question is, uh, is that true only up to first order in epsilon or is it true at all orders in epsilon? Uh, what? Uh, the what? fact that uh, the Hamiltonian and the transfer and the transfer matrix have the same uh, eigenbasis. It's true at all order of epsilon, actually. Yes, mm -hmm. it's true. Uh, the, uh, actually, one can prove that the XXZ chain is integrable because it has infinitely many integral of motion, and this integral of motion are the, ex the coefficient of the expansion of the transfer matrix in this epsilon. If you like, this is a possible way to see it. Because the transfer matrix uh, commutes between themselves. This is explained, for instance, in the book of Baxter. So uh, you can expand in some parameter. And then if you expand, it is clear that the coefficient of the expansion have to commute between themselves as well. And this is a, a possible um, complete set of uh, integrable, integral of motions. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, all right, are there other questions? Yeah, I have two basic questions, if I can ask. Sure, sure. Can you hear me well? Yes. 
Okay. Yes. Uh, so the first question, fairly simple. Can you tell me what is the order parameter in uh, that distinguishes between the disorder and the ferroelectric region? Well, for instance, you can you can think of um, uh, suppose the probability of some of having some up arrow on some vertical edge. This is polarization. And this is one order, one point correlation function, uh, order parameter. So you look at the, if you are in this phase, for instance, this phase you have a lot of A with respect to Bs and Cs. So you are in a situation in which you, your diagram is all made of heavy lines. Okay. And of course, if you say, what is the probability of having an heavy line on a vertical edge, it will tend to one. So this polarization is one. Instead, if you are in a disorder regime, you have a lot of A and B, C, more or less in the same quantities. And you can, so you will see here that on average, you are, will have some full arrow and some empty arrow. On average, they will be the same number. And then the polarization, this one point correlation function is zero. So this is the order parameter, which is uh, one or zero. Okay, thank you. You actually answered both questions at the same time. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Please don't hesitate to ask uh, questions. Yeah, I have a short question. Sure. Um, can we do a similar expansion around this so-called tri tree critical point? Maybe overseas one. And Yes, uh, Filippo, did you hear the question? Not very well. It was very uh, So ca uh, can you do a similar? So you did this expansion around the around the point uh, where a a over c is one and b over c is zero. Yes. Uh, could you do the say a similar expansion around the point where b over c is one? Oh, sure, and sure, a over sure, c? sure. You know, a and b are. <laughs> if you reverse all horizontal arrows. The model is essentially the same, and this corresponds to exchange A and B. So it is uh, just um, you choose one. But do you get similarly something nice like XZ chain? Yes, you get the exact chain. Uh, again, you change the exact chain. So the only difference will be that here you will have exchange of the role of alpha and beta. That's all. Okay. okay. So it's uh, just. Uh, it's the same, you can do the calculation, we'll see it will be exactly the same calculation with the role of alpha and beta exchanges. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, other questions? Well, uh, if I may add, it's clear from the phase diagram that there is a complete symmetry with respect to the main diagonal. So uh, exchanging A and B is just, uh, is nothing. It's a, a symmetry of the model. But it's not entirely clear from from the drawing of the vertices, is it? No, uh, from the point of view of the vertices, well, if you exchange all, if you reverse all horizontal arrows only, then you exchange A and B. Look at, look, uh, yes, yes, yes. look over there. Mm -hmm. For instance, here, if you exchange all horizontal arrows, this means that actually you are exchanging on the horizontal link heavy with heavy lines with thin lines. So this will become this. We reverse on the horizontal line, okay? So I have just exchanged the A vertex with the B vertex and vice versa. Yes. yes, thank you. And if well, this is not, uh, well, we see maybe this doesn't work. No, we see this, this doesn't work, yes. But uh, actually, the rule is slightly more complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, thank you. Uh, other questions? Start again. I'm here. So what we have done, we have uh, made a review of the synthetics model uh, its phase diagram and its connection with uh, exact that chain. Till here, we have not spoken about boundary condition, and it is not clear at all what is the relation with tilings. So, let us show this relation with tilings. Uh, 
So the relation is as follow. Uh, here what I have on the left, I have put uh, a picture of a possible domino configuration of the Aztec diamond. And on the right, I have put the corresponding configuration in terms of lines for the six vertex model. So it is a Aztec diamond of order one, two, three, four. And indeed it is uh, a six vertex model on a four by four lattice. Um, I would like to, to no, f so first, first question. Uh, it's not a bijection. Uh, you see, you can associate to, you, you put, you, you, you can imagine your domino tiling are a tiling with square, which have some drawing on it, as it is shown in the, in the line of, uh, of square with red lines. So you see here you have this square, you can imagine to tile with some rule which connects these squares. And uh, this rule implementing that the drawing that you will have when you tile your square with these tiles is uh, coincide with the domino tiling is essentially the ice rule. And uh, the other thing to say is that when you have two parallel dominoes, you will have uh, uh, one of these two configurations. So it appears, and you associate both these configurations to the same kind of C vertex. So that is why here you have some one half. You have to put some one half in order to give, a, I mean, you have to associate. Uh, <coughs> I, uh, it's not the one half, sorry. Uh, you have to associate uh, to a given uh, uh, local configuration of C vertex, you will have two, two given, uh, two, coin, two equivalent domino configurations. So it is not a bijection, but every time you have a, two parallel dominoes or two parallel dimers, uh, you can reverse the orientation of them and this uh, will be weighted, both configuration will be weighted by the same C vertex. The other thing to pay attention is that this construction works only if, again, in the left side, you imagine to have uh, this uh, uh, sub lattice, which take one, 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 one side, only one every two sides, only one every two sides, which is the condition I told you yesterday uh, to have integrability when you add some weight to the C vertex. The last thing is that here I, there is some weight C square and here there is some weight one for the other C vertex. Uh, so it is not the situation. It is. So here I have given the same weight C to both. In the other situation, I have a weight C square for the two because you have two equivalent times. But this is not important because as you can see, since you, your lines flow from north to west, if you have some line configuration and you want to replace, you, you make a local substitution. So you, you consider another path which is equivalent to this one, except for one case here, you see that in this case you have one C and in the new path you have three C. So here you have one C, which is, uh, let us call it uh, C2. This is C2 and this is C1. So here you have one C2, but you see that immediately when you deform locally, you make, you make this kind of deformation. If you want to, to introduce some C1, then you will introduce an additional C2, you know, you have two C2. So it appears that the C1 and C2 always come in pairs. This is a general factor. So without losing in generality, you can distribute the weight all on this weight, or you can take, the, you can take assign one to this and C1, C2 to this one, or just uh, you can play with this in some sense. This is especially true when you have some particular kind of boundary condition, for instance, fixed boundary condition, where uh, uh, 
uh, well, no, it's true in general, not only in this particular condition. It is a fact that that the C come always in pair, so you, you can play with the C1 and C2. So what else to say? Um, yes. So you have uh, the relation is if you let us cancel this. If you this is available, and the point is that yes, we say that, that uh, every time we have this kind of of configuration. We introduce a weight e to the delta. So if you have a, a equal one, b equal one, and uh, c one equal one, and c two equal uh, e to the two e to the delta. Sorry, e to the delta. E to the delta. You can compute with the formula. With that formula, the large delta, and you see that this will be so. Here it is. Okay, you will see that the anisotropy parameter large delta will have this expression. So you will see that since for real delta, for real value delta, and you want this, you are doing statistical mechanics, so your weights must be real. So this is real, and so it, it can vary between minus infinity. Uh, I am saying, what's the point? Yes, uh, since e, this is always positive, you see that this quantity can only be smaller than one. So you are only describing the regime delta smaller than one, which is in the phase parameter, corresponds To, to this region, you are excluding this other region. What I am saying is that there is no direct correspondence between the six vertex model and the dimer model for delta larger than one, okay? Uh, if you want to study some limit shape phenomena for delta larger than one, you have to introduce some kind of different model. Well, it's obvious in some sense here. If you want to study some limit shape phenomena, you will have in, in the bulk some ferroelectric uh, regime, the boundary can induce some ferroelectric regime. You will have no limit shape, no non trivial limit shape, no phase transition in the space. So, this is somehow obvious. And it is uh, obvious also from this consideration. You can have a, a no dimer like behavior for delta larger than one. And indeed, for delta larger than one, uh, limit shape has been studied in a slightly different context uh, for what is called the stochastic version of the six vertex model by Gua and Spawn. And uh, okay, this is just a side comment. So, um, ah, another thing I want to say. Uh, sorry, can I ask something here? So, just to be sure. Uh... Yes. Um, so, um, okay. So that so are are you saying that uh, this model with a deformed uh, weight for this for for when you have two aligned uh, dominoes yes. that it's always critical? No, no, no. no it can be also anti-ferroelectric, but it can. Uh, you will never uh, reach a ferroelectric region. But. Uh, Ah, I see. I see. So it can be. So you can go into the small uh, triangle in the bottom left of the phase diagram. We can go. Sorry. Yes. Uh, so I will. Uh, you can go here and yes, here, okay. but you can not go here. Okay. 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 Yep. But uh, it's not really important. Uh, you imagine why. So. 
Another thing I wanted to say is, uh, is, is that, so uh, this is the correspondence between six vertex model and tiny, but now what is the correspondence between boundary condition on the six vertex model and boundary condition? Uh, we, d we do not see anything anymore. We just have ah, uh, a exactly. screen. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Yes, I wanted to show you. If you look on the left, you have the attack diamond. If you look on, on the right, uh, where you have this line configuration, what you see is that the boundary condition, which corresponds to the attack diamond, is not periodic. Actually, it is fixed. It is a particular boundary condition, fixed boundary condition, where uh, sorry, we see the slides now. We don't see what you are drawing on the blackboard. Yes, sorry. Okay, so you you can see that well, the boundary condition we are shooting is fixed and correspond to choosing heavy lines on the top and heavy line on the left and no lines or thin lines on the bottom and on the right, okay? So I, I will uh, come back to the picture just that you can observe this. Okay, uh, if you look uh, at, for instance, at the top boundary, you see that the configurations that you have are correspond to uh, necessarily correspond to vertex of of, uh, of type, type one or type three. And so this means that you have and heavy lines on the top always. Okay, and the same on the left to, that is this correspondence. So Aztec diamond translate, the, the boundary condition of the Aztec diamond translate in the case of uh, the six vertex model in the language of the six vertex model translate into what are called in this particular kind of boundary condition, which is called the domain wall boundary condition. Uh, sorry, we still see the slides. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So uh, this particular fixed where every, you put heavy line on the top and on the left is called a domain wall boundary condition. It was introduced uh, in the 80s in, for theoretical reason to understand uh, in the, the norm of beta states for the XXZ quantum spin chain. So it was completely unrelated uh, reason, but then you see this quantity that is a partition function of the six vertex model with this particular boundary condition was appearing in the result. So it was studied and it was uh, studied, introduced by Korepin in 82. And then it was uh, the model, the partition function was defined, but the solution for the partition function in terms of determinant was given by Isergin in 87. And uh, the partition function of the model is therefore not known, but uh, maybe it's not uh, necessary to write it. I mean, we shall not need it directly for what follows. So, now we have established uh, in, a more, in a clearer way the correspondence between the six vertex model and these styling models. And so we can see what we can do with these new parameters, with these new parameter delta. So let us start with to showing you some numerics, which is the simplest way. So here, what I show in the first row, you have three simulation to three different values of delta, which correspond in the phase diagram. We are considering three pictures here. The three pictures correspond to three values of delta here in the antiferroelectric region. And uh, what happens? You have a, uh, in the center, you are away from the boundary. You don't feel the boundary. You can imagine that uh, phase diagram of the uh, periodic boundary condition model are valid. And so since you have tuned delta to be lower than one, you are in the antiferroelectric region. 
Then near the boundary instead, what you have, you have this frozen region, is this ordered region induced by the boundaries. And in the middle, you have a transition. You see, you have a diamond, and then you have a kind of, of a disk. And, and this intermediate region between the diamond and the outside of the disk, which is, is disordered. So you, in the six-way fix model, you see these three regions. For if you choose delta to be smaller than minus one. If you choose instead delta to be in this region, then you will have no antiferroelectric region in the middle, but you will have, uh, this is shown in the second row. No, I am not correct. In the second row, you, you, you see values of delta going from minus infinity, which is this, just in this corner. Okay. Ah. Yes, sorry. You, uh, so delta in the first picture, delta is minus infinity, which corresponds to the origin of the phase diagram. And then delta increase, so you are moving on the diagonal till delta equal minus one, which is uh, the boundary between antiferro and critical phase. Delta equal zero is a free fermion point. Delta equal one half is a combinatorial point, but it's just some generic delta at this level. And so you see that you have uh, the boundary between disordered, which is blue, and ordered, which is almost black region, is moving. Uh, uh, it depends on delta. For delta equals zero, you can recognize that it is a circle. Well, more or less a, a, an arc of a circumference. But uh, otherwise, uh, the shape between the critical and the ordered region uh, can move. It becomes a line in the limit delta to minus infinity. And also, what you can see is uh, if your delta is uh, negative, smaller than minus one, you already see this in the picture with delta equal minus seven. You see that an equal polarization uh, is a diamond. The antiferroelectric diamond is just in the top right corner of the delta equal minus seven region. And so you have a really rich behavior. This is another recent simulation. And uh, this is in a delta equal minus one. So you are uh, really uh, on the critical line, delta equal minus one so on, between antiferro and critical. And what you see, it's not even clear if this is an effect of, uh, of, of course, it's probably an effect of a finite size effect, but uh, there is uh, no control, or no explanation of what is this behavior of oscillation. There are very tiny here, what is plotted is just the fluctuation of the density or of the polarization, or, or if you like, of the density of domino with respect to the average value. Uh, multiplied, uh, I mean, you have to to multiply it uh, by 1,000 to see something. So it is a really very tiny effect. Okay, so we can come back. And uh, I will tell a little bit what is uh, known and not known. So we would like to extend the program of the six vertex model. Sorry, of, we uh, still see the slides. Sorry. <clears throat> we would like to extend the, the program, which has been more or less fulfilled for domino tiling, that is understanding Arctic curve, even on complicated domain, and uh, fluctuations and limit shapes, and fluctuation of Arctic curve and limit shapes. We would like to, to understand all, uh, to fulfill the same program for the six vertex model. So I have to say that uh, some progress has been done in the last 10 years, but uh, really a lot remains to be understood and uh, uh, it's difficult to obtain results in this context. So one question is the Arctic curve. You would like to determine this Arctic curve. Uh, I will speak more on this tomorrow, but uh, here the situation is more or less under control. So in the case, uh, I will discuss qualitatively the behavior of this Arctic curve. So this is, I will report only quarter of the Arctic curve. Okay, so this is the center your six vertex model of the lattice of the domain 
you are considering. You have domain wall boundary condition. What you have is, is essentially this. It's important to give some picture. Here you will have a, a lot of line in this way. Here you will have a lot of line in this way. Here you will have nothing, and here you have a lot of line in this way. Okay, and then here, this line will, will be more disordered. Here they are fully packed, here there is no lines, here you have only vertical lines, and here only horizontal lines, and here you have disordered. And so you can, uh, these lines uh, fill this region in a non-fully packed way here, and uh, there is a, again an Arctic curve, and uh, one would like to determine it. So if you tune delta to zero, this is free fermion case, and uh, uh, well, uh, we know the Arctic curve, it's a circle, okay? The circumference. So here I am plotting one quarter of the circle. I would like to say that if you have a, a circle, this will continue, continue in the, here in an analytic way. So here the, the curve is analytic. And actually it's an algebraic curve, of course, the circumference is an algebraic curve. But a, a remarkable result of Kenyon and Okunkov is that when you consider domino tiling on planar B partite graphs with some conditions on the boundary condition, which are very, very wide. What you obtain for the Arctic curve and is that it will always be an algebraic curve uh, with maybe various components, but an algebraic curve. And in particular, you will have here always uh, analyticity. Okay, so if you consider the Arctic curve for the, this model here, what you see is you have a dependence on the parameter of the model, which I which are these two of this delta and t, but uh, the parameter from t is trivial, so let us ignore it. We shall discuss the, the dependence on delta, and it appears that uh, you can compute. It is a heuristic derivation, but you can compute this. I just uh, show you what is qualitatively the result. So, Actually, for delta equal minus infinity, you have this line, which is exactly coincide, coincide with what we have shown, uh, we have seen in numerics uh, five minutes ago. For delta equal zero, you have exactly a circumference. And uh, as you vary delta, increasing delta in this direction, what you see is that the disordered region increase and increase. Uh, actually, there is a limiting region here in this way for delta going to one. So is, as all delta goes to one, moving in this direction in the limit shape, here what you see is a kind of limiting curve in this way, which is a little bit intriguing. Um, so the first question to say is that, uh, for instance, for, for delta equal one alpha, is here, let us say, delta equal one half. This is a very simple curve. It appeared to be a quarter of an ellipse. An ellipse which continues in this way, a way. If you, as an algebraic curve, this will continue in, in this way. But uh, uh, what is important is that instead you have a kind of symmetry. Uh, if you have reflection with respect to the horizontal or the vertical semi-axis, you will have symmetry. So the Arctic curve here have, have to be continued in this way. And so it is evident that here you have no, no, no analyticity and so that the full Arctic curve is not anymore an algebraic curve. Moreover, even if you concentrate on one piece of the Arctic curve in the first quadrant, sometimes you will see that it will be algebraic or non-algebraic according to the value of delta in a kind of fractal way. If you parameterize delta as something like, uh, cos to eta, you will see that if eta is a rational number, eta over pi, sorry. 
you will see that if eta over pi is a rational number, then the curve is the curve in the first quadrant is algebraic. Instead, if eta over pi is a real number or a non-irrational real number, then the curve will be trans transcendent. It will be given in terms of a, a complicated non-algebraic function. So this parameter eta, of you prefer delta or what is called q of the sub of the subject and quantum group, give you a new parameter which uh, can play a role because uh, because uh, the Kenyon Okufkov paper about algebraic curve was actually put in, in a one-to-one -one correspondence, a particular kind of curve, the so-called Arnak curves of algebraic curves, with the choice of the boundary condition. So it was a, a, first, a first partial classification of a subset of algebraic curve. Here you have one more parameter. So you could think that this Q which can be related to, to rational, sorry, um, how do you say this? To roots of unity or non-roots of unity, uh, to article which can be algebraic or non-algebraic, okay? So uh, this additional parameter could help in the direction, for instance, of further classification of algebraic curve. So oh, sorry, can I, uh, let me in, just interrupt a bit and uh, just yes. to slow down a, a little bit. Uh, let, let me ask uh, some uh, very uh, simple, perhaps uh, stupid questions. So, um, okay. So, so first of all, could you just uh, uh, maybe for the sake of uh, uh, some of uh, for the sake of of, uh, of the, uh, those of us who don't know uh, what an algebraic curve is, could could you just uh, Say what it is. Yes, you're right. An algebraic curve is a curve in principle. Well, it can be in any in any number of variable. But let, let us consider, for instance, f of x, a function of two variable equal zero, define you a curve in the plane. And uh, if uh, the function f in an, is an algebraic function, f of uh, the corresponding curve is said to be an algebraic curve. So what is algebraic? It is a, a kind of a polynomial of any degree in x and y. Yes, okay, thank you. And, uh, and then uh, just to make it clear, uh, so you, you mentioned the Okunkov Kenyon several times. Um, yes. That was for the free Fermin case, right? Yes, yes, yes. For the free Fermin case, you have all this full theory which was put under one roof by Kenyon and Okunkov essentially. Yes. Okay. And so their big result was that uh, you got you, in for free fermions, you always get algebraic curves. Yes. One, was, yeah. one of the many is that. Yes. yes. And now what you're saying is that uh, this is not, no longer true unless eta is uh, eta over pi is a rational number. Exactly. Well, there are two kinds of uh, normal elitis here. One is uh, due to the fact that if you have, uh, for instance, in the case of Aztec diamond, you have a circle. Then when you multiply, you have it in a quarter and you extend it by reflection to the full quadrant, then you have still the same circle, which is analytic at the contact point. But when you do this for delta different from zero, you break this analyticity at the contact point. This is the first effect. The second effect is that even if you restrict to one quadrant, then you have this problem, uh, not this problem, you have this peculiarity that the curve is algebraic or not, according to, to being at a root of unity or not, mm -hmm. in the quantum group language. Yes, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, are there questions in the audience? Uh, because this was quite advanced, so maybe uh, let's see if uh, people have questions. Perhaps, sorry, I can ask a question, Jerome. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Um, so why is it so important that the curve is transcendental or algebraic? I mean, why people, they are interested in this? There is a deep oh. reason or is just some mathematical? Uh, no, from the mathematical view, you know, there is, there is no classification at the moment of algebraic curves. 
algebraic curves are a, a subset of possible curves, a relatively small subset, one could say, or a relatively large, it depends on point of view, but there is no classification. So a, a very first partial classification was the one uh, uh, introduced for a very small subset of, Arctic, of uh, algebraic curves by Kenyon or Konkov. Uh, they managed to classify a subset which are Arnak curves. We, I don't want to enter details. I mean, Arnak curves are a very, very peculiar subset of algebraic curves. Okay, so this is important from the mathematical point of view. Uh, even mathematicians are very interested in this development in the six basic model because, uh, because uh, they see that they have one more parameter, so this could help in enriching this application, for instance. And, uh, Sorry, the, just uh, to make it completely clear, this additional parameter that you're talking about, the, this is delta, delta. right? Yeah. Delta, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, so, okay. Uh, are there questions? Would be good to have questions just to... Just to keep the discussion uh, alive. Um, Okay, well. I have a question. Good. Yes, yes. Uh, could you please uh, motivate a little bit more the interest of this uh, uh, RT curve? And uh, I mean, just to maybe, is, yes. is, is, is maybe it's too early to, 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 to say this or maybe not? No, no, I can spend the, just a couple of minutes. Yes, well, for, I mean, the RT curve in say in, in itself, you can think as a game. Uh, you have done everything for the free fermions, and you, you see that the six vertex model, in principle, allow you to work out exact results. So you want to, to try it. This is just kind of uh, like uh, playing Sudoku. <laughs> this is uh, so it's kind. Of, it's not really a strong motivation, you could say. But um, so then, from the mathematical point of view, of course. Uh, when you have some new exact result, also from the physical point of view, this is interesting. And uh, then there is this relation with algebraic curve and their classification. And finally, it is because uh, actually what we are interested in is the full limit shape and the fluctuations. But uh, uh, the problem is uh, quite uh, difficult. And so the Arctic curve is the simplest step in that direction. So that's why there is interest in the Arctic curve in particular, because it is the only thing that you can, at the moment, more or less control, uh, analytically, exactly. OK. <clears throat> so oh, yes, I have still uh, 10 or 15 minutes. And uh, yes, so. This, uh, so there is a exact, I, I don't want to put the solution because it will take one blackboard, but uh, this is an exact solution. So you can write uh, X of T and Y of T, a parametric form of the Arctic curve, which depend on parameter, of course, sorry, T is not a good parameter. X of uh, Xi and Y of Xi, which are actually Depend, depending on the parameter of the model, which are T and Delta. And when you vary Xi over some interval, X and of Xi and Y of Xi uh, describe the Arctic curve. So this is a parametric representation for the Arctic curve. It is available, it is exact. And uh, the derivation is not totally rigorous, but it is uh, widely accepted. And so, uh, so the sorry. next step is sorry. Sorry, what is what is t? Is the is t the ratio? Uh, t is uh, here. B over a. Or, yeah. Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. So uh, you 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 have this uh, big formula. You plug t and delta. Then you put on mathematica. You plot and you obtain these curves. Okay. This set of curves. Then the next step concerning Arctic curve would be. But uh, let's go beyond the, the square. Beyond the square, for instance, one could be interested in finding the Arctic curve for a six vertex model, which has this shape, just as Nokunkov uh, considered uh, the tiling of the hexagon. So, first, cone and prop uh, considered tiling of the hexagon and found again a circle. And uh, if you 
then Kenyon and Okunkov considered the model we say sorry cut off rectangle cut off uh, region and what they found was a cardioid so I mean, in principle, what you want to do is to find some recipe to compute Arctic curve in very general situation. And uh, for instance, in the case of the Sylvetex model, you, you are interested, you could be interested. An example is to the first uh, attempt that you can do to go beyond the square domain is to consider a region of this type. Of course, if the cutoff triangle uh, square in the top is very small, it will not interfere with the Arctic curve and nothing will change. But if you take a bigger one, then of course the uh, Arctic curve will change and it will assume a form of this kind. And so you would, you would like to be able to compute this kind of Arctic curve. And uh, so this is one question. And uh, actually uh, some general technique which is called uh, the tangent method has been developed which can help to tackle such more complicated situation. I will discuss this in detail tomorrow. Then another question. So about Arctic curve, there is a more or less control of the situation. Of course, it's very difficult to obtain new Arctic curve for slightly different boundary condition or slightly different uh, domain, but uh, it's not hopeless, let us say. But then uh, and another question that you can do is, of course, you are going from a situation if you consider the situation where, where the, the, the square here you cut off is small, and so it does not interfere with the Arctic curve. And then you, you cut off this, you move smoothly this cutoff region, you increase it in such a way that you go to this situation, you expect to have some phase transition, it's a kind of geometric phase transition induced by the boundary condition, because uh, you see that you will have an abrupt transition at some stage when the square start to touch this line from this situation to this situation. And actually, at least in a free fermionic situation, because of the Y calculation become uh, too difficult, at least at the level of delta equals zero, you can study this phase transition and it appears to be of third order. There is some motivation for this third order phase transition, which is simply that if you compute the partition function for this model, as a function of this cutoff rectangle, you see that it can be, as a free fermion point, it can be rephrased as a, a log gas with discrete measure, discrete measure. And so you can use uh, all the technique of random matrix model. And you know that in random matrix model, you have this douglas kazakov third order phase transition. And actually you have a very similar mechanism here, slightly different because the measure is discrete, but uh, it's similar. So just to summarize, concerning Arctic curve, there is some control. And moreover, you can also move continuously, deform continuously your domain. And what you see is the emergence uh, of this third order phase transition. Sorry, uh, when you say third, uh, third order, does that mean that, uh, what do you, what quantity do you use to correct? Sorry, it's, your, the free it's the free energy. You so you mean the, the third derivative of the this energy. model as a function of this size? Yes. Okay. And you mean and then the, uh, you compute the free energy and you deform it, and you see that there is a third yes. order discontinuity. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, how to obtain this Arctic curve? Uh, well, uh, I will explain uh, a little bit this tangent method tomorrow. Well, uh, instead, if you consider. Uh, what is really interesting is much more than the Arctic curve. The Arctic curve is a little bit like a game, as I said. One, what we would really like to know is the limit shape, the full limit shape, or in the language of uh, the six vertex model, the polarization, the one point function. But uh, this is still uh, out of reach. The one point function in this model, you see this model, of course, translation invariance is broken because the distance from the boundary count. So, the one-point function in this model has the same level of difficulty of a two-point function in the XXZ chain. And as you know, despite a lot of pro progress in XXZ chain, uh, the analytic form of uh, the two-point correlation function as a function on the lattice without uh, is still unknown. 
well, you have uh, a lot of progress, uh, for instance, by the Lyon group and the Wuppertal group, but then at some stage you have to implement uh, things numerically because the results are partial. partial. So, yes, so what we would like to compute is a limit shape. To compute the limit shape means to compute some function, for instance, let us call it uh, sigma, sigma of uh, j k where j and k are the coordinate of the lattice so for instance uh, let us say this is j k and uh, and then uh, you would like for instance to compute what is the probability on the edge on the vertical edge of a j k to have an up arrow you can call this sigma j k but uh, at the moment nobody is able to compute this quantity but uh, of course we hope it's possible. I mean, we are working at it because we hope it's possible. Uh, then, then there are two other questions which were addressed for the Daimler model and uh, which you would like to address also here. One is, what about the fluctuation of the Arctic curve here? In the case of the domino tiling, this was obeying Tracy Widom. And um, in the case of the 6 vertex model, no analytic result is available for the first subleading correction to the large n limit which gives you the Arctic curve. Uh, this correction are still unknown. So it's, we don't know what happens here, but there have been recently, it's still unpublished, uh, numerical result by Prauer and Sporn, which uh, show in quite uh, clear ways that here again, you, you recover Tracy Widom distribution. I would like to mention here that um, one, what I should say, I would like to say that if you do the Hamiltonian limit that I have mentioned before to go from the C-Vertex model to, to the FXZ chain, you can relate uh, these kind of problems with the quantum quench of an XXZ chain when you start from all up spins on the left of the origin, all down spin, let us say, on the right of the origin. Then, so this is your initial state. You make it evolve in time. You can see it if you think as of the spin as particle. Then here you have a, a space. I mean, your space is completely filled of, of uh, particles, of fermions, and here it is completely empty. The density here is one, and here the density is zero. And uh, the profile of the density is a step function, okay? Then you, you take X, Z, Z, Hamiltonian, and you make your state evolve, and what you see is the light cone effect. So here the density is one, here the density is zero, and here you have a, a, a non-trivial profile. And actually, this line cone effect is a remnant after the Hamiltonian limit of what you have here, where you have a, a ordered, ordered, and disordered region. Here it's the same. You have ordered, ordered, and disordered region. So one could say maybe what you see here, the fluctuation of these are similar to the fluctuation you will see across the light cone in the exit jet chain. It appears that in this case, the fluctuation are not anymore Tracy Widom. This has been shown by, by Viti, Collura, De Luca. Uh, so here, as soon as you take delta different from zero, you Tracy Widom. Uh, I mean, uh, airy, airy, let us say, airy behavior is destroyed, okay? So it is remarkable that, I mean, of course it is not a contradiction because uh, when you do the limit, probably you spoil, but it appears, and it was not obvious, that instead, if you are still in the six vertex model, this is uh, still Tracy Widom. Uh, since I am speaking about uh, the Hamiltonian limit, I would like also to say that what I have said before about the behavior with respect to eta over pi being rational or irrational number, 
when you make the Hamiltonian limit, has remarkable effect of fractal type. There are uh, several recent paper by, maybe even by Jérôme yourself, surely by Jean-Marie Stéphane, by Calabrese, by maybe several names. And what you see is that uh, in the quantum quench version, you see that uh, uh, you have, uh, here you don't, I mean, the qualitative behavior, when you go from eta rational to eta rational, is the same, you have a smooth behavior. But instead, if you consider, for instance, a uh, spectrum of, of excitation or things like that, you see that here you have a fractal behavior which depends on the, on the um, value of theta being rational or irrational. Uh, the last thing to say is about fluctuation of the limit shape. The limit shape, I recall you, is the surface. Um, I have not said you, well, you could introduce a surface an height function for the six vertex model following what I have told you for the domino tiling, but it is much simpler to consider another one. You know, you have, a, you have, for instance, this given configuration, and uh, you just, uh, anytime you cross a line, you increase the height function by one in this direction. So, You imagine here that the paths are just osculating, all right? So this is a way to think about the height function. It's, its derivative is essentially polarization. Its derivative uh, along the horizontal or vertical direction will give you horizontal or vertical polarization. And uh, sorry, why I say this? Yes, so you would like to compute the height function and you would like also to calculate the fluctuation of the height functions. and. Uh, it appears to be still a Gaussian free fermion in a rough language, uh, only numerical result, not much more than numerical result are available, but uh, you can see that uh, uh, if you consider the fluctuation in the disordered region, in the case where you have uh, phase separation, you see that instead of having for for the height function, an equation of motion of this kind, where here you have what is sometimes called the stiffness, you have an equation of motion of this kind. Where this K is actually the determinant of some Hessian and depends on the coordinate. So you have a kind of free field uh, where the stiffness depend, is non-homogeneous, depend on, on the coordinates, which is a quite non-trivial behavior. If it was depending, independent of coordinate, you will have the usual conformal free boson, and, uh, but this makes things more complicated. This is a recent work by Jérôme and uh, Jesper Jacobsen. Then I think that for today, uh, we could stop. Huh? Uh, there was a question. Ah, oh, but I already answered. Yes, somebody asked me yesterday about uh, survival of Tracy Widom in the Sigvetes model, but uh, yes, I think we can stop here. I answered about this. So I think uh, we have time for questions, if you like. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, thank you. So are there questions? Uh, sorry, I have a curiosity. Sure. Yes. The, the last thing that you mentioned about the continuum field theory. Yes. Disordered region. So in the end, uh, it's not possible that uh, some uh, interaction term arises in the case where delta is different from zero. Well, uh, you know, uh, the interaction term may be, I mean, uh, this is an effective action where you have hide the problem inside this non-homogeneous K. Actually, mm -hmm. if you would like to formulate the problem in terms of fermions, you see that you have a quartic term emerging. Okay. You know, if you consider, for instance, Daimler model can be expressed in terms of free fermions in, in a very standard way. And uh, when delta is different from zero, you see that uh, what emerge is uh, some quartic term in the fermion, and then the model is still integrable. It is of the family, well, 
It is still integrable, but uh, it's not anymore free. It's interacting. Okay. Okay, so in this bosonic formulation, formulation is just that uh, this quartic iteration has become the, the inhomogeneity of the stiffness parameter. Yes, well, this is effective theory. So, you know, uh, it's also based on a lot of numeric, but it, uh, it gives a nice description of what happens. But maybe Jean can comment more on this. Uh, no, it's what you said. I would answer the same as what you said, uh, Philippe. So I just, the fact that uh, interactions do uh, in the microscopic model do not generate uh, an interact an interaction term in the in the act in the effective action uh, of your field theory, uh, this has nothing to do with this complicated uh, inhomogeneous problems. It's uh, this is standard al already in Luttinger liquid theory, right? Yes. I mean, you describe you know you describe interacting electrons with a with a free boson. Uh, so, so yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Um, uh, okay, so uh, uh, we have a question in the chat, um, but uh, I need to read the question first. Uh, um, I need to understand it. Uh, sorry. Uh, I had another question. So is, is there anything special happening at this combinatorial point that you mentioned several times? Um, yes. is so at the combinatorial point, the RT curve is very simple. Uh, it's again a, a, an algebraic curve of order two, like the circle. It is an ellipse. But it is, well, the circle, the full Arctic curve is the circle. The full, sorry, the full Arctic curve at delta equal zero is a circle. The full Arctic curve at delta equal one, one alpha is, let us, so here you have this ellipse which goes in this way. Uh, I will do it in another way, it's more efficient. So the so ellipse goes in this way at delta equal one half. Uh, it's not very clear. Anyway, you have a kind of ellipse which goes in this way, but only this portion of the ellipse is the Arctic curve at delta equal one, one half. And then you have to reflect this portion four times to obtain the complete Arctic curve, which has nothing to do, which is made of four portions of four different ellipses. Okay, so what is special is that the result is particularly simple. Instead of having an equation of the kind x squared plus y squared equal one fourth, you have something like x squared plus y squared, I don't remember, but something like minus xy equal one fourth. Mm -hmm. you, you see? Mm -hmm. And so it is a remarkably simple solution, but at the same time, you have lost analysis in the contact point because you have to do this reflection and you have a discontinuity in the second derivative, you see. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the combinatorial point allow you to make simpler calculation, but that's all. So yes, for since uh, you asked about combinatorial point, yes, of course, this is what is called the limit shape of alternating sign matrices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this is uh, for people which know the combinatorial point. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so now, now the question in the chat. So, uh, is this so? Is this phenomenon uh, specific to the six vertex model, and therefore also to the to the dimer model or, or dominant no, 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 tiling no, no. model that you've mapped it to, or or is the or can you think of more so, general vertex models? Um, if you consider the eight vertex model, you have not anymore this charge conservation. This was a quote cited yesterday by Balash for the X, Y, Z chain. So eight vertex model, no limit shape for phenomena. No non-trivial limit shape, no Arctic curve phenomena. But if you consider the 20 vertex model, which was quoted yesterday by the guy who, who lives in Illinois, but on the European central time, uh, the 20 vertex model is a kind of six vertex model on a 
well, I could be wrong because I have not seen this for some time, but you can imagine a, 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 a triangular lattice of this kind. So you, again, you put lines in this way, but now your vertex are much more complicated because you have uh, six lines entering. You impose the ice rule, and you see that the possible vertex are 20. This is called the 20 vertex model. You have article phenomena, which are currently studied by Philippe Di Francesco. And uh, by the student which yesterday told us about this. Um, all right, thank you very much. Uh, so are there other questions? Uh, I, I have a question. Sure. Uh, so the, you said that, uh, okay, in some cases, if this uh, parameter, uh, uh, eta is, uh, is rational, then uh, the curve is algebraic. Yes. So the degree of the algebraic curves uh, is studied. It depends on what is known. Uh, yes, it is studied. Uh, he, there is a paper, uh, I made a paper maybe 10 years ago with a student. It's uh, Colombo Pronco Noferini, uh, maybe 2011. But uh, essentially, you can write eta over pi. It's, it's a, an attempt of studying. There is no definite result, but for, for sure, you, you can write et over pi when it's rational R p over q. And of course, there is a relation of the degree of the algebraic curve with this p and q, which I don't remember exactly now, which was a, it was a question of majorating and minorating. It was a bounce on the degree. It was not really an exact relation. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Um, I just had one question about sure. the Canyon Okunkov result. If so, did I understand right that um, they've only found algebraic curves for free fermions? Sorry, I didn't understand. Maybe the question is uh, so, do Okunkov Canyon find only algebraic curves for free fermions? Yes, uh, yes, they only, well, it's a strong statement. I would say yes, yes, they only find the uh, algebraic curve, but uh, they study, you know, uh, dimer uh, on planar graph, uh, probably there could be some difference if you do not restrict to planar graph, that is graph which you, that you can draw on a planar surface. Okay, and in, in this, um, where you here get, something different, get yeah, transcendental curves. What would that correspond to in their picture? If that No, like... sorry, sorry, sorry. I... Yeah. <laughs> the audio is not good. I do not understand well. So um, in terms of how they mapped the dimer tiling uh, to free fermions, yes. so that, that breaks down in the case that that mapping doesn't work right in the case um, where you have transcendental curves and I guess I was wondering if that can be understood on the free fermion side. This, <laughs> this might be a very bad question, <laughs> sorry. No, so the, so the question is, uh, they use a mapping, so the question is, they use a mapping from, uh, so from dimers to free fermions. And Not that... really, they study, it's a remarkable paper. They, they put, uh, you know, they, they study dimers on the torus. Then on the torus, Everything is periodic, and you can make a kind of Fourier transform huh? because it's dependent, so it's linear. And then you can make a kind of uh, this continuous limit uh, quite easily. But it is uh, something that you can do only for. Uh, they don't use the language of free fermions. They use the language of Castelline, um, Castelline matrix, and Castelline determinant. But of course, you can you could obtain Castelline matrix, Castelline determinant. Uh, from Grassmann variable and particular on Grassmann variable. So it would be the same, but their main ingredient is starting from Castelline. And uh, then you have this linearity, which allow you to, to derive a lot of results. Okay, thanks. Uh, Does that answer your, your question? I think so. My, the one thing I'm just a bit confused about is where, how that relates to the cases that you can get for this particular model that you showed where it's not an algebraic curve. Um, 
Ah, so the question is, okay, so the so question the is how, question. did you understand the question, Philip? No, no, sorry. No. Uh, the question <laughs> I, 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 is how, how does the, how does the Okunkov uh, Kenyan uh, technology, how does it uh, relate to, to your own, uh, uh, to your own you, you can results? extend nothing, yeah. you can extend, you can, uh, there is uh, no possible, the, the result of Kenyon Okunkov are very beautiful, but uh, you can really do nothing beyond free failure with that. Uh, that was the problem, actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I think, yeah, uh, maybe to explain this, uh, you have to, to tell us a bit more about, uh, about how you got your results for the, for the, for the yes. algebraic curve, right? Uh, yes. So Okunkov Kenyon is really based on, as you said, as on a, on a computation of the of the free as a, as, a, as it's based on the fact that you can express a relatively simple expression for the free energy for the translation invariant system, and exactly. then you write an action that you minimize and you find uh, okay you find some yes. results like that, mm -hmm. uh, and your result is is obtained in a completely different way. Maybe you can yes. tell us. Uh, Yes, okay, I will uh, speak a little bit about this tomorrow. So, okay, okay. Yes. but uh, it's based on computing some correlations very shortly. It is based on computing some correlation function for the six vector model. And for this, you have to use techniques which are essentially related to beta ansat, algebraic beta ansat and quantum inverse scattering method. Then you obtain some expression for some correlation function not one point, uh, I mean, uh, in some sense, uh, less sophisticated correlation function, but enough to discriminate the article. You evaluate the scaling limit of this expression and you find where is article uh, by this in an exact, even if not completely rigorous in an exact way. Okay, but it has nothing to do with, uh, with uh, Kenyon Okunkov method. But I think we could, uh, there is time for question from four to, to whatever time <laughs> this <laughs> afternoon. So we could leave uh, the question for this afternoon. And also, uh, please do the exercise. I have given you no new exercise, but I, I try to do the exercise I gave you yesterday. <laughs> so uh, we convene at two for the lesson of uh, Balash, and then uh, at four there will be question time. And uh, that's all. Mm, then there will be question time every day, every afternoon. So. I think we can stop for today. For okay. this well, uh, let me let let me just uh, thank you for on behalf of the people who are listening online. And so, yeah, so I clap. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> See you later.